short prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So the title of this talk is The Consecration and Conversion of Russia, the Role of the Laity in Obtaining the Fulfillment of Our Lady of Fatima's Requests. In the Kobe Center, we have a, a principle that we follow, which was articulated by St. Augustine, the great father and doctor of the church. It is that in necessary things, you should have unity, in doubtful things, liberty, and in all things, charity. And I mention this at the outset because some of the things that I will talk about are necessary things. We must, for example, believe in the dogma of creation as it was handed down to us from the apostles. But other things are not defined and Catholics are entitled to form opinions and to share those opinions in a spirit of fraternal charity. So some of the things that I'll say giving you my perspective on the situation in Russia, these are informed by my reading and experience, including two visits to Russia and two visits to Ukraine over the last 20 years. But they're not the official teachings of the church, so you're free to disagree with me. But hopefully what I share with you will still be edifying. So our agenda is this. Our Lady of Fatima's request for the consecration of Russia signifies that Russia has been chosen by God to be a light to all the nations. This consecration properly carried out will activate the potential that God has already granted to Russia to become a great Catholic nation. Divine providence has already begun to sow the seeds of Russia's conversion but Russia is not yet a converted country. Traditional Catholics should avoid two extreme positions, an adulation of Vladimir Putin and the current regime on the one hand, or a demonization of Putin and the Russian regime on the other. By living our consecration to Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, as requested by Our Lady of Fatima, we can call down the graces necessary to, for the Pope and the bishops to make the consecration of Russia exactly as requested by the Queen of Heaven. To live our consecration, we must offer up all our thoughts, words, and actions to the Most Holy Trinity in union with the hearts of Jesus and Mary. When enough Catholics do this, the Holy Father will receive the grace to make the consecration of Russia properly which will result in the complete conversion of the Russian people to full communion with the Catholic Church, ushering in an era of peace and the greatest evangelization the world has ever seen. Now, as you know, on July 13, 1917, the Holy Theotokos told the children at Fatima that she would come to ask for the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart and for communions of reparation on the first Saturdays of the month. She said, if her requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. But she also said that if her requests were not heeded, Russia would spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. On October 13, 1917, Almighty God then worked the greatest public miracle since the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the miracle of the Son, to confirm that the message of Our Lady of Fatima was urgent and true. Now it's interesting that in the entire history of our country, there has only been one apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary that has been fully approved by the Church. And that was the apparition of Our Lady to Adele Breeze in Champion, Wisconsin in 1859. 
Now this apparition occurred six weeks before the publication of Darwin's book, Origin of Species. And the message of Our Lady to Adele Brees, an 18 year old Belgian immigrant who would become a religious sister was teach the children their catechism. Now, in God's providence, the bishops of the United States had recently met in synod and agreed that they must develop a catechism for all the Catholics in the United States so that they could learn the doctrines of the Catholic faith in a uniform way. And that became the Baltimore Catechism. So Adele Brees taught the Baltimore Catechism to thousands of immigrant children in Wisconsin. And what did she teach these children about the origins of man in the universe? This is from the teacher's guide for the Baltimore Catechism that was used in all the dioceses of the United States and praised by dozens of bishops from one end of the country to the other. In the beginning, God created all things, something particular on each of the six days of creation. All these he has called into existence by merely wishing for them. So the bishops of the United States mandated that every Catholic in every diocese in this country be taught that God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain in six days by simply willing them into existence. St. Pius X, who reigned up until three years before the Fatima apparitions, mandated the use of the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of Trent. And this was the gold standard for teaching and preaching the dogmas of the faith throughout the entire world for 350 years. And it's still authoritative. It's the only catechism quoted in the new catechism. It's quoted 20 times because it gives such beautiful, clear definitions of the dogmas of the faith. And St. Charles Borromeo and the authors of this catechism made sure that every Catholic in the whole world was taught that God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain in six days and then rested from creating new kinds of creatures. And the Catechism of Trent refers the pastors of the church to Exodus 20, where they can read and teach their people that God with the finger of God wrote in tablets of stone that we must remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because in six days God made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. This was not just what was taught by the Baltimore Catechism and the Roman Catechism. It was what was taught in all catechisms. Saint Therese of Lisieux, whom Saint Pius X called the greatest saint of modern times, taught, learned the faith, from the famous Catechism of Perseverance of Monsignor Gong. And that catechism also teaches all the children that God created everything in six 24-hour days. And it's interesting that today we have so many theologians who think that with one simple objection, they can dismiss the literal historical interpretation of Genesis which was upheld by all the fathers and doctors of the church. And that objection is, well, you can't have days without the sun, and the sun wasn't created until the fourth day. Therefore, the days of Genesis are obviously just to be taken allegorically. Not so. The little flower, like all the children of her time, and that wasn't very long ago, were taught the answer that the fathers and doctors handed down to us. Why were the sun, moon, and stars not created until the fourth day? And the answer given by St. John Chrysostom and all the greatest teachers, they were not created until the fourth day to teach men that they are not the authors of the productions of the earth. God wished thereby to prevent idolatry. And what happened 
in all those parts of the world where people forgot to remember the revelation that God gave of how he created the world. They began to think that since all life depends on the sun, that the sun is a god and must be worshipped and even offered human sacrifice. How wise we think we are and how far we have fallen from the true wisdom of our fathers in the faith. But St. Pius X, on the very eve of the apparitions of our Blessed Mother in Fatima, saw what was coming. He saw that already in his pontificate, in the church, had appeared the worst heresy in the history of Christianity, modernism. He wrote his greatest encyclical, Pascendi, on modernism, calling it <clears throat> the synthesis of all heresies and identifying its principal doctrine as evolution. Why is that? Because the Pope saw that every other heresy in history added something, subtracted something, twisted things, but left most of the faith intact. St. Pius X saw modernism is different because modernism is based on the premise that everything is evolving. There are no stable natures. There is no unchanging truth. And he saw that if the modernists <clears throat> took control, they would destroy everything. Because they would say, the liturgy that was good 500 years ago, it's not good for us anymore because we've evolved into a new situation. The marriage law that was good for our great grandparents, it's not good for us anymore because we've evolved into a new situation. And he saw they would do this with all the doctrines of the faith. They would all need to be updated. And that's exactly what we see all around us today. Now, Our Lady warned that if man did not repent and turn back to God, Russia would spread her errors throughout the world. And the principal error that took hold in Russia weeks after the miracle of the sun was not communism. It was evolutionism. Because if you study the lives of the principal leaders of the communist revolution, you will find that they were first convinced evolutionists before they were convinced communists. Lenin, for example, was raised in an orthodox home, but he became a convinced evolutionist after reading the works of Darwin. And it was that faith in the alleged scientific fact of molecules to man evolution that made him such a confident communist materialist. On his desk, he had a sculpture, this sculpture, a chimpanzee sitting on a pile of books, one of which is Darwin's Origin of Species. And as Lenin sat at his desk contemplating this sculpture, he authorized the murder of millions of his fellow countrymen because they stood in the way of evolution to the communist utopia. Trotsky was the right-hand man of Lenin, and Trotsky lost his faith in God when he read Darwin while he was in prison, and he became a ruthless materialist evolutionist, believing that any kind of evil was justified if it could bring about evolution of mankind to the communist utopia. When Trotsky was forced out of the way for Stalin, Stalin took the helm. And when Stalin was just a young man, he read the works of Darwin and Lyle, became an atheist evolutionist, told the seminarians in the seminary where he was, the Bible's a pack of lies. You need to read these books. We're descended from apes. There is no God. And Stalin was responsible for the murder of more than 20 million human beings because they stood in the way of evolution to the communist utopia. Well, the Blessed Mother said that the errors would spread and the Russian communists were the principal sponsors of Chinese communism. And what did Mao Zedong say? He said the foundation of Chinese socialism rests on Darwin and the theory of evolution. 
This is Bishop Cuthbert O'Gara, a passionist missionary bishop from Ireland who was in China when the communist troops overran his diocese. And he was amazed to see that whenever the communists came into a town, the first thing they did was to force all the adults to go into a hall for a seminar. And he wondered, what's the seminar going to be? Is it going to be Marx? Is it going to be Lenin? Is it going to be Mao Zedong? No, it was always the same. Evolution. You are a product of a material process of evolution. There is no God. There is no soul. There is no afterlife. There's only matter evolving because the communists knew that if they could get the people to believe in this evolutionary mumbo jumbo, they could get them to believe in everything else that the communists wanted them to believe. Margaret Sanger was another one who jumped on the evolutionary bandwagon. And she saw that with birth control, governments could use birth control to prevent the less evolved people from having children and only allow the more fit, the more highly evolved people like herself, of course, to reproduce. And in this way, she saw we could get rid of what she called the dead weight of human waste. Here in the United States, there was Kinsey raised in a devout Protestant home, goes to university, retains his faith in God for a little while, but eventually is overwhelmed by the evolutionary indoctrination, becomes an evolutionist, an atheist, goes to Harvard, gets a PhD, and founds a new science, the science of perversion. And this science is based 100% on evolutionary pseudoscience. The basic gist of it is this. According to Kinsey and company, back in the Middle Ages, we had this quaint idea that God created a man, body and soul, and a woman for the man. And that by the very design of their bodies, you could tell that certain kinds of behavior were natural, normal, and good, while other kinds of behavior were obviously unnatural, abnormal, and evil. Well, Kinsey says, thanks to evolution, we're liberated from that, because now we look at our cousins, the bonobos, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, and we see that they do all this behavior that back in the Middle Ages, we used to think was unnatural and abnormal. But now, thanks to evolution, we know that it's actually natural, normal, and good. And believe it or not, it was with this pseudo-scientific hypothesis from hell that Kinsey got a generous grant of money from the Rockefeller Foundation to begin the new science of perversion. And it, hit, and it was his science of perversion that resulted in the criminal code being changed and the medical code being changed and the psychiatric code being changed so that today there are many places where you can lose your license to practice medicine or psychiatry or go to prison if you say that what is unnatural, abnormal and evil is not natural, normal and good. But it gets worse because this same pseudoscience from hell has entered into the very citadel of the Catholic community. Here we have the conclusion of an article published in the Catholic Theological Society of America by the rector of a Catholic seminary at the height of the abuse that was going on that would later be brought to light by the mass media. And this is his conclusion. At this time, the behavioral sciences have not identified any sexual expression that can be empirically demonstrated to be of itself in a culture-free way detrimental to a full human existence. 
Here we have the rector of a Catholic seminary responsible for forming future priests and bishops saying that empirical science, evolution-based empirical science has proven that there's actually nothing you can do in this realm that is really harmful. And it gets worse than that. Bishop McHugh was in charge of Family Life Matters for the entire United States Bishops Conference. And he worked hand in hand with planned parenthood, so-called educators to design what? To design mandatory sex education programs for all the schools in the Catholic schools in the United States. How was it possible for a successor of the apostles to work with the leaders of the anti-culture of death to prepare materials to destroy the innocence of Catholic children in every diocese in this country. Well, if you read his writings, you'll discover once again, it all goes back to evolution. Undoubtedly, when Bishop McHugh was in the seminary, maybe in the 40s or the 50s, his professor stood up and said, gentlemen, we used to think that Genesis could be taken literally, but science has advanced. Science has enlightened us and gentlemen, we now know that it's an exalted myth that God really used a process of hundreds of millions of years of evolution to evolve the first human beings. And so out the window for the future Bishop McHugh went the truth that God created one man, body and soul, for one woman whom he created from the body of the first man one man for one woman for life from the beginning of creation. And so in this statement, it's a little bit of gobbledygook, but I'll translate it into plain English without doing any violence to his meaning. Bishop McHugh essentially says this. We know that at this stage of evolution, the union of man and woman is the way that children normally come into the world. But he says, we can't rule out that there will be wonderful evolutionary breakthroughs that will allow children to come into the world in other ways. In other words, Bishop McHugh separated two things that God joined together by the very way that he created St. Adam and St. Eve. And what did our Lord Jesus Christ say? He said, what God has joined together let not man put asunder, not even a bishop of the Holy Catholic Church. And it all culminated here when Cardinal Baldessari was made the moderator of the recent synods on marriage and the family. And he was asked by members of the Catholic press, your eminence, why is it that so much time is being spent in this synod discussing things which would never have been entertained for a moment in the prior entire history of the church. Things like people who were married in the church, divorced, married outside of the church, being given Holy Communion. Things like people living in a way that traditionally has been taught to cry out to heaven for vengeance. Now, so much time is spent discussing how can we find a way to make these people, without changing their lives, feel welcome in the church, even to give them Holy Communion. In 1929, the time arrived. Our Lady came and she said to Sister Lucia, now God asks of the Holy Father to make and to order, not to ask, that in union with him, and at the same time, all the bishops of the world make the consecration of Russia to my immaculate heart. Have you ever wondered, why did Our Lady wait 12 years to ask for the consecration of Russia? Why did she come 
1929. Well, there's some very clear clues if you study what was going on at that time. You may remember that in the French Revolution, which was like the warm-up for all the communist revolutions that followed all over the world, the leaders of the Reign of Terror wanted to obliterate the memory of God and Christianity. And they knew that one thing that was necessary to accomplish this was to get rid of the seven day week because everyone knew the seven day week comes from the revelation of God that he created everything in six days and rested from creating new kinds of creatures on the seventh day. So they introduced a 10 day week. Of course, it was a complete failure because God designed us in our very human nature to live according to the seven day week. And everyone who's ever tried to replace it with something else fails because human nature cannot endure any other kind of rhythm. But the Carmelite sisters of Compiègne were inspired to offer their lives for the end of the reign of terror. And after they had all been guillotined, the reign of terror came to an end almost immediately. This is relevant to Our Lady coming at this particular time because it so happens that in that very year, Stalin, following in the footsteps of Robespierre, introduced a new calendar called the Soviet Eternal Calendar, which although it kept the 365 day year, it made a five day week with every six weeks equaling a month, intending to keep factories running continuously with workers taking staggered days off. Each individual was assigned a color which corresponded with which of the five days of the week they would take off. Unfortunately, <laughs> this did not increase productivity. It ruined family life since many family members would have different days off from work. Also, the machines could not handle the constant use and would often break down. Is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that after Our Lady warned us about the errors of Russia and the principal error that took hold in Russia was this blind faith in evolutionary pseudoscience that the evolutionist leaders of the Soviet Union tried to implement this five day week based on their complete rejection of traditional Christianity it is not a coincidence. And indeed, in that very year, Pope Pius XI called for prayers throughout the Catholic Church because of the acceleration of the persecution of the church that began in that year in Russia. He wrote, during the Christmas holidays in January, not only were hundreds of churches closed. This is in 1929. Great numbers of icons burned. All workers and school children compelled to work and Sundays suppressed, but they even compelled factory workers, both men and women, to sign a declaration of formal apostasy and hatred against God or else be deprived of their bread rationing cards, clothing and lodging without which every inhabitant of this poor country is reduced to dying of hunger, misery, and cold. The suppression of Sunday is the attempt to obliterate the memory, not only of the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Sunday, but also that first Sunday of the world when God said, let there be light and there was light. Now, what did this mean, this consecration that Our Lady requested? When I converted to the Catholic faith 50 years ago at the age of 18, I read a book about Fatima and I fell in love with it. But I noticed that a lot of Fatima literature made it seem that the consecration of Russia was designed to fix a broken 
nation. And it was when I visited Russia for the first time in 2005 that I came to the realization that this is a terrible misunderstanding. Because in our church and throughout salvation history, consecration is the activation of a potential for divine service that God has already placed in a person, place, or thing. For example, I have a daughter who is a novice in a Benedictine abbey. When she was consecrated into novitiate and received a religious name, Sister Chiara, this was not done because she might still have a few neuroses or bad habits and this consecration would somehow heal her of them. It had nothing to do with that. The consecration into novitiate was a recognition that she and her superiors had discerned that God had given her a vocation to be set apart for his service. And this consecration activated that gift, that potential. It's no different with the consecration of a nation. When I visited Russia, I was amazed to see that in spite of all the horrors of the communist era, Russia had retained a thoroughly Christian culture more than 1,000 years old that permeated every aspect of their life, their architecture, their music, even their folk music, their clothing, their food, every aspect of their culture is, has an expression that is uniquely their own Christian expression of their culture. And this is something that it is very difficult for us Americans to appreciate because there is no such thing as American Catholic culture. It doesn't exist. All the Catholic culture in this country was brought from somewhere else, from Croatia, from Bavaria, from Italy, from Sicily, from places that had a Catholic culture. But Russia has a Christian culture. And after participating in a conference sponsored by the Moscow Patriarchate in defense of the traditional Christian doctrine of creation, which was attended by outstanding Orthodox scholars in theology, philosophy, and natural science. We were the only three Catholics in the entire assembly. We had got along so well that we were invited to a very special service in the crypt of the Cathedral of St. Savior in Moscow. And I saw things in that service, in that it was a concert, a Christmas concert. Vladimir Putin was in the front row with the patriarch and innumerable bishops, priests, members of government filling the place. And there was one point, there were a number of points where the chorus would start to intone a certain song and everyone was on their feet singing it. And there was a Russian student who was translating for us from Russian into English. But there came this one particular song where everyone got on their feet. And this was the chorus that they sang. Vladimir Putin, the patriarch, all the dignitaries, bishops, priests, members of parliament, and everybody else. The chorus was, there are only three things in life worth living for, worth dying for, God, the motherland, and the czar. And that brings us to Vladimir Putin. Because today, within the community of Catholics, there seem to be two different ideas about Vladimir Putin, which are quite popular, but which are quite incorrect. One is the idea that Vladimir Putin is some kind of incarnate devil, an evil dictator, a kind of Hitler figure 
who uses religion as a mere tool to consolidate his power, who invades sovereign nations simply because of his lust for power and who is totally corrupt. At the other extreme, there are traditional Catholics who believe that Vladimir Putin is a kind of saintly ruler who is leading the global resistance in the whole world against the godless new world order by defending persecuted Christians and upholding the natural law and the traditional family against the relentless anti-Christian propaganda and economic pressure of the new world order elite. I submit that the real Vladimir Putin is Vladimir Putin, the astute politician, not the incarnate devil and not the saint, but the astute politician who realizes at the natural level that the strengthening and development of his country requires the unifying influence of Christianity and a rejection of the secular humanism and moral relativism of the new world order. However, this embrace of Christianity in Russia has been mostly external, with the government, for example, spending millions and millions of dollars to build beautiful churches throughout the country, to make sure that there are Russian Orthodox chaplains with all military units, providing them with all the religious services. But meanwhile, as of 2019, according to the Moscow Times, only 6% of Russians attend religious services. 70% identify now as Russian Orthodox. But how serious are you about your faith if you don't even go to worship God on Sunday? And meanwhile, Russia continues to be plagued by one of the world's worst rates of abortion, almost half a million per year. Although the pregnant percentage of pregnancies ending in abortion has declined by 39% in the last five years. So this leads to the question, is Russia a converted nation? We have to acknowledge that the Russians are trying to encourage people to have children. They have cut the rate of abortion more than in half. This is a great achievement. Putin and his administration have been successful in greatly reducing the amount of alcohol abuse in Russia, which is a very, very serious problem. And life expectancy, which was 56 years for men in the 1990s, has climbed to 68 years for men and 78 years for women. These are significant positive achievements. But what I submit to you is that these positive developments are taking place on the natural level. Is Russia a converted nation? Russia experiences 4.7 divorces per 1,000 people. Over 50% of Russian marriages end in divorce and the rate of divorce has been increasing. This is not a converted country, but it is a country whose leaders are trying to restore the observance of the natural law and to recognize that Christianity supports and builds on that foundation. Now, what about the war in Ukraine in relation to the spiritual condition of the Russian Federation? We must understand the origins of the war in Ukraine are very different from what we hear in virtually all mass media. It is a fact that the Obama administration grossly interfered in the internal affairs of a sovereign nation, Ukraine, resulting in the flight 
of the lawfully elected head of that country. We have to recognize that when a government that our administration and NATO powers had put into place took power, one of the first things they did in the Russian-speaking eastern portions of Ukraine was to pass a law that Russia would no longer be considered an official language. This would be like the government in Switzerland saying, German is no longer going to be an official language in Switzerland. How do you think that would go over? It wouldn't. But this was done with the full support of our administration, and it led to war, to hostilities in the local area, and the hostilities went so badly for the Ukrainian forces against local forces, not Russian military, that they agreed that they would negotiate. Our government and the NATO powers sabotaged those negotiations. We could have supported them and there could have been a peaceful agreement and this war that's going on now would never have taken place. We sabotaged those negotiations and what many Americans do not realize is that in the days prior to the Russian invasion, the Ukrainian military was intensively shelling civilian areas, areas in eastern Ukraine populated by Russian-speaking civilians. They were being slaughtered. This graph shows you the mounting intensification of the bombardment of civilian areas leading up to Putin's decision that he had no choice but to protect people who looked to him as their only protector. So has the consecration of Russia been done? As Our Lady of Fatima asked, no. But have the consecrations that have been done brought down any grace? Yes, we would have to say yes. But the difference is this. The progress that we see in Russia today has almost all been on the natural level. But when Our Lady of Fatima, the Queen of Heaven, is completely obeyed, what we will see will be supernatural. As in Guadalupe, when Archbishop Zumraga perfectly obeyed the request of the Queen of Heaven, there was a supernatural outpouring of grace. An entire people converted supernaturally. That is what will happen when all of Our Lady's requests at Fatima are perfectly fulfilled. What about the most recent consecration? On the positive side, Russia was explicitly consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Many bishops participated in the consecration. Ukraine was part of Russia when the consecration was originally mentioned by Our Lady of Fatima. So some would argue that it was legitimate for Ukraine to be mentioned. But on the negative side, there was little or no mention of reparation for sin. No expression of repentance for sins of the leaders of the church, such as the Pachamama incident. No mention of first Saturday communions of reparation, specifically requested by Our Lady as a condition for the conversion of Russia. And finally, bishops were invited, but not ordered to participate as Our Lady had said they should be. Now in her famous interview with Father Fuentes in 1957, Sister Lucia told him that the Holy Virgin had told her many times that many nations will disappear from the face of the earth, that Russia will be the instrument of chastisement chosen by heaven to punish the whole world if we do not beforehand obtain the conversion of that poor nation. But notice that just because Russia might be the scourge does not mean that Russia is necessarily more evil than those who are scourged by Russia. That's important. But we have been warned by those 
who had the true gift of prophecy, like Blessed Elena Aiello, beatified by Pope Benedict XVI, that if we don't convert, if there is not massive repentance by Catholics, she said another terrible war will come from east to west, where Russia with its secret armies will overrun Russia, will overrun Europe. But St. Padre Pio helps us to keep everything in perspective. As when speaking to a group of American pilgrims, he made this emphatic statement. When they asked him, Padre Pio, will Russia ever convert? And he said to them forcefully, Russia will convert. And when Russia converts, it will happen very fast. And Russia will be an example to America of what it means to be a converted country. And you see that very fast tells you that it's a supernatural conversion. What we have seen over the last several decades has been a kind of restoration of the natural foundations. But grace builds on nature. And when Our Lady's requests are completely fulfilled, then we will see the supernatural outpouring of God's grace upon this entire nation. And then St. Padre Pio's words will be fulfilled. But did you know, as God loves to foreshadow the fulfillment of his providential plans, that there was a czar who lived 200 years ago who actually tried to restore unity between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Church of Rome. Tsar Alexander I was responsible for defeating, defeating Napoleon's army through his scorched earth strategy in Russia. And he had a very profound religious conversion during this period of his life. And he became convinced that it was the will of God that he, as the civil leader of his people, send an emissary to the Pope in Rome to negotiate the restoration of unity between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church under the Pope. And he sent his emissary, but the emissary was not able to negotiate this before Alexander I died. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of that wonderful saintly woman, Blessed Anna Maria Taiji, the wife, mother, and mystic, the mother of six children, the Roman housewife, who was the confidant of bishops and cardinals and all kinds of dignitaries of the church while she cared for her little family in a very poor apartment in Rome and who had one of the greatest mystical gifts in the history of the Catholic Church, a son in which our Lord Jesus Christ showed her what was happening anywhere in the world at any time that she, la that she asked and also what would happen in the future. And when the emissary from Alexander I arrived in Rome, there were no telephones or internet communications. He did not know that Alexander I had died, but Blessed Anna Maria Taiji was shown in her son that he had died, but that he had died reconciled to the Catholic Church and that he had been saved because of that and because of his genuine efforts to restore unity between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Church of Rome. Now, there is something I want to share with you now before I conclude, and you can take two different approaches to it. One is, since I'm going to be citing men who are considered saints within the Russian Orthodox Church, you could take the view, well, Caiaphas uttered a prophecy and he was an evil man. Balaam uttered a true prophecy and he was a pagan. So maybe these guys could utter true prophecy even if they weren't even in the state of grace. Or 
You could take the view, which I'll tell you is the one that I have embraced, which is that when communions that were in schism came back into communion with the Catholic Church, they have been allowed in a number of cases to continue to commemorate their saints who were recognized as saints during the time when they were outside of communion with the Catholic Church. St. Gregory Palamas is an example. The Melkite Greek Catholic Church, with the full approval of the Vatican, has been allowed to commemorate him as a saint for a long time. And it's sad on both sides. There are polemicists who on the, the Latin right side say Gregory Palamas is the worst heretic who ever lived. And on the Orthodox side, believe it or not, they say St. Thomas Aquinas was the worst heretic who ever lived. If you really want to know the truth of the matter, there is a fantastic scholar at Cambridge University, A.N. Williams, who wrote a book, The Ground of Union, where she proves that their theology can be reconciled if you care enough to study the two great authors in their own language and understand the idioms that they use. It can be done. So with that as my intro, St. Seraphim of Sarov is considered by Russian Orthodox the greatest prophet of modern times. Now, whether you accept that in the future, after Russia comes back into communion with the Catholic Church, St. Seraphim will continue to be commemorated, but he'll be on the Catholic liturgical calendar or not. This is a fact. He prophesied the revolution of the godless communists and the murder of Tsar Nicholas and Alexandra a hundred years before it happened. And he wrote it down and it was given to Tsar, Alex to Tsar Nicholas and his wife so that they knew to prepare themselves for martyrdom long after St. Seraphim of Sarov had gone to his reward. And he made a prophecy of what would happen after this period of godlessness that he foresaw in the communist era. And he said this, before the birth of Antichrist, an eighth ecumenical council must be convened of all the churches under the one head Christ and under the one protecting veil of the mother of God a last and eighth ecumenical council. Its aim will be to unite and reunite all the holy churches of Christ against the growing anti-Christian tendency under a single head, Christ the life giver, and under a single protecting veil of his most pure mother, and to deliver a final anathema against the whole of masonry and all the parties similar to it under whatever, whatever names they may appear the leaders of whom have one common aim under the pretext of complete egalitarian earthly prosperity and with the aid of people who have been made fanatical by them to create anarchy in all states and to destroy Christianity throughout the world and finally by the power of gold concentrated in their hands to subdue the whole world of anti-Christianity in the person of a single God-fighting czar, one king, Antichrist, over the whole world. Now, it's very interesting that St. Seraphim of Sarov calls this the Eighth Ecumenical Council because he recognizes they can't have an ecumenical council without the Pope. They've had synods ever since the schism of 1054, but he's implicitly recognizing that this council is going to be in communion with the Pope. So how will we get there? How can we help to obtain the complete fulfillment of Our Lady of Fatima's requests? We must do what she asked us to do. We must live our consecration to Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary in every thought, in every word, and in every action. Our separated brethren have had a lot of success with these bracelets 
that say WWJD, meaning what would Jesus do? And it's true. Imagine if everybody on earth had a bracelet, WWJD, and before they did anything, they said, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Things would improve pretty fast. But as Catholics, we are called to something infinitely greater than WWJD. And you can see it right on the back of the miraculous medal that most of us are wearing right now. Because Almighty God willed that the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus would be separated on the back of the miraculous medal. They're never separated. So what's that about? It's because our heart is supposed to be there between the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary. So we are not supposed to live. What would Jesus do as if our Lord is up in heaven and we think about what he would do if he were here? He is here. He lives in us. We receive him in Holy Communion. And he has given us his mother to be our mother. So our watchword should not be WWJD, but JMWSWD. Jesus, Mary, what shall we do? And we have our Lord Jesus Christ on the right hand, our lady on the left hand, and we do everything with them and with the same intentions that they have. JMW, SWD. And that is what will bring about the complete fulfillment of Our Lady of Fatima's request, because didn't she say, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Immaculate Heart triumphing is something interior. Everything external will follow when the interior triumph is achieved. And that's something that everyone in this room can help to bring about. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Ghost, pray for us. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.